there's an underlying terrible sadness about my childhood because my parents lost both their parents and siblings. My father had four sisters. And the terrible thing is I don't even know their names because it was never, ever, ever discussed. And my mother had an elder sister who went to Holland with her husband and a three-year-old son and they were all murdered. They all went to Auschwitz. So there's an underlying, perhaps deep feeling of sadness. I mean, there were certain things you could never mention. I mean, I have no idea about what my grandparents were like. In fact, I don't even have a photograph of them because I think my mother couldn't bring herself to believe that she would never see them again. And I've got a photograph of her dog, but you know, it's extraordinary sort of childhood. So you have, I, my mother got one brother who survived and he was sent to Dachau. And this is how the Germans got their money before the war. Uh, he was sent to Dachau, which was then a slave labor camp. And if you were Jewish, you could get your son out if you paid them a large amount of money and he was given a one-way ticket out. And so he came here and he married and had, you know, I have a cousin, one cousin. But it wasn't even that, you know, it wasn't to be discussed. You just knew never to raise it if anything about the Holocaust ever came on TV, turned off immediately. All those supports for a family, all the family that you have and the extra people, they just weren't there. But it meant my parents were pretty, pretty interesting because they were trying to find out all about Britain. And they came here and I suppose they were anti-fascist, so they were left-wing at first because uh, anything um, that was anti-fascist was the right thing. So yes, we did sit around and talk about politics. And I mean, even when I was too young to join in, I heard this and they, they had quite a wide circle of friends because a lot of their friends, none of them, by the way, that they knew in Vienna or that they knew in Hungary, but new friends, new, there were groups who set up, you know, in the war. And my father joined the army as well. Um, and I always remember he's the only thing he ever said about the war was he said, I was standing in somewhere in Suffolk holding a wooden gun. And he said, I wanted to murder Nazis with my bare hands. And I felt so ineffectual. Um, but they gathered a group of other people, you know, from other countries that were dispossessed and had been through this nightmare. And they were always, they always talked about politics. I mean, international politics as well, because some of this group thought they should go to America. America was far away from Europe and was safe. So yes, I did grow up in a political family. So we, and we watched the news. I mean, listened to the news all the time. Can you remember the first time you cast your vote? I guess the first time I cast my vote was when I could. And you're going to ask me who I voted for. I would have voted, I think, for Labour, certainly at that time. Because also, the other thing was, life was changing. So um, my father banned me from going to university. He thought, a girl, I would get married, I would have children, that would be a waste of my time. And of course, I was born so long ago that people got married in their 20s. So my father thought that's what I would do. And I would, you know, look after my husband and my parents. And I, I have to also explain, my mother died quite young in that order. And so he told me at 14 that when I left school, I would go to leave and go out to work. And I persuaded him that I wanted to do a, a very small art course, which I did abroad. It, it was six months. It was meaningless really and then I went out to work and I very luckily ended up working in a publisher's and then at a, a company called Simpsons of Piccadilly which used to be a huge department store and then I met all these girls from fashion magazines who were coming and choosing things to be in their pictures and I thought that's what I'd like to do I was very lucky. I was told about a job on Honey Magazine. Now, you're probably too young to remember Honey Magazine, your mum probably. And at, I think 21, 22, I went for an interview with Audrey Slaughter, the magnificent who sadly died about 10 days ago. She said, I want you to do a double page spread exactly the way you would do it in the magazine. And I got the job because I think she quite liked the style and the idea and the art course hadn't been a complete waste of time. But also underneath I put stockists and I put this dress is available in Hull. 
and Manchester and all of that. Because I did that because, of course, my parents knew people from the provinces as well. And so I was aware there was more than London. And I got the job and it changed my life. I want to go back to the fact that you think you're pretty sure that if the first vote you cast would have been for the Labour Party. As I say, my parents were, it was anti-fascist, whatever. Um, I certainly, I mean, certainly they became British citizens straight after the war and they always voted. And I certainly think at that time we felt very other. I guess there's always a slight feeling of feeling other when you're Jewish, but they were not at all religious, of course, because my mother had been totally um, assimilated in Vienna. In Vienna, there was a huge Jewish population. And I, I remember she telling a friend of mine who then told me, she said it was Hitler who told me I was Jewish with a great big J stamped on my passport. And my father's family had been a bit more observant, but I think the Holocaust made them question a lot of religion. Um, and so we had bits of religion every now and again. So my father became a businessman and he traveled and he, he loved tools. He loved things that made things. I mean, he had no formal training in it. I mean, he only escaped because my grandfather um, had vineyards and made wine. And my father and his uncle were sent to Paris to learn the business. And the only thing he ever said was there was a phone call. So you can imagine how rare a phone call from Hungary to Paris was. And he said, my father said to me, leave Paris, leave tonight, both of you, don't come back, go to England, go to America, he said. And my father stopped at London, which I'm rather pleased about. So they knew people from the provinces and they certainly, I think they were all left-wing at the time, not madly left-wing, but anything that would stop anybody on the right. Um, it was that point of view. And also they were, not very well off at all. I mean, my childhood had an appearance of being sort of middle class in that, you know, we laid the table and we, you know, whatever. But there were often weeks when there was no money. And my father was a mad inventor. So he invented everything from tents that came out of your roof rack uh, to um, costume jewelry to a thing that you stack on the side of your pan. So when you did a fry up, you could put the tomatoes and the bacon up there while you were doing the eggs, which worked, I mean, interestingly. Um, uh, but then lots of things he did didn't work and they have fell from view because they didn't last and we were broke. So they would have felt um, very much with the workers. You know, they would have felt they were not middle class. They didn't understand. And my mother was 17, so she was, she, and like most women, found it easier to grasp onto languages. So they lived uh, this sort of pretty tough life. I mean, you know, I went to the local school. My parents had no idea what was a good local school. So I went to the nearest one, and two of my classmates were murdered by their fathers in drunken rages. Not the same year, but they were. I mean, it was tough, rough school but wonderful teachers who'd all been widowed or made single by the First World War. And they were all miss somebody and they, they taught us brilliantly. Our first impressions were left wing. And I can remember being very excited about things like CND because what was the point of saving yourself if you were gonna be bombed, you know, et cetera. And I remember, you know, talking to women who'd been at Greenham and saying how extraordinary that was. And also, I think I was very lucky because that was the slight rise of women being able to work and having to work and then talking to women in the war who'd worked and then the men came back and they'd been thrown back into being housewives. And they all said, don't stay at home. You've got, you earn no money. You've got nobody to write an HR report saying you're brilliant don't stay at home. And that was the feeling. And my mother went to work every day in my father's slightly ramshackle office. Um, and sadly, when she died young, you, re you realize she held it all together because she died young and then the whole edifice slightly collapsed. By 1987, you're editing the Sunday Mirror. Yeah. Uh, this is the, yeah, still the height of Thatcherism. Yes. But your paper is supporting the Labour Party. Correct. 
how difficult, I don't know what your politics were at that time when you were editing the paper, but, but so I don't know how difficult it was to say, I, I, I'm editor of the Sunday Mirror, therefore I support the Labour Party, publicly at least. I got, as many journalists did, very fed up with the unions because newspapers then were run by the printers' unions. They would come along at six o'clock on a Saturday night or a Friday night and say, there'll be no paper this week, we're striking. So when Mrs Thatcher came in, I thought, well, it'd be quite interesting to have a woman in the top job. I think Jim Callaghan had an impossible task. So I started to change my views. And so, of course, the other interesting thing that happened to me is I met Tony Blair and thought he was brilliant. When was that? When he was elected uh, well, leader? I, or? I, when, when I first became editor of the Sunday Mirror, which was 1987, Alistair Campbell was my political editor and saved me from many, many a slip. Um, I was always grateful for that. And uh, I, he introduced me to Tony Blair, I think, when I was still a woman's editor on the Sunday Mirror, and so many years before. And I admire Tony Blair. I still do admire him. I think he's got many of the right ideas. And I know the Iraq war has caused a sort of split, but I think that he did that before we understood that a war in the Middle East really solves nothing. I worked with Gordon Brown later. Oh, I got on very well. Tessa Jow was a great personal friend of mine. So I've always been what politicians hate, you know, somebody who's friendly with everybody because you speak as you find and if you get on with people. I started to move towards perhaps the Labour Party isn't the only game in town. And then I met Thatcher because there was a thing for all editors or one of those things. And whether you were Sunday Mirror, Sunday Mirror, you met her. And she was really, really, and I know everybody says she hated women, was no good. She, I couldn't have been nicer to me. She agreed to do a piece for the Sunday Mirror. She agreed to do whatever. And she, she did a piece for the magazine. I thought, well, maybe she deserves a bit of a go. And I have to say, I've floated in between. I'm a centrist, I guess, is what I feel. I'm down the middle. I can see good on both sides. I'm, I'm a, a feminist. I think possibly more than anything else. So anything that's good for women, is good for me as far as I'm concerned. You say that you're a centrist, but you didn't vote for Tony Blair, which makes me think you stuck with the Tories. Oh, no, no. I think oh, I, oh, okay, go on. I think <laughs> the other thing is, why can't I remember about, and then I, through lockdown, I don't remember what happened yesterday. I mean, I think I probably did vote for him in the middle right. because I really thought he was... I thought, and this is very important, I thought when he went out on the world stage, he would do right by Britain. I'm afraid since then, of course, the Labour Party has lost my vote possibly for some time, but we can talk about that in a minute, but that's to do with anti-Semitism and Jeremy Corbyn. But I certainly, I'm certainly open, very open to discussion, and I'm very open to how Britain gets ahead, because... I think we're at a very interesting stage now when we come out of lockdown and now we're in Brexit. And, and I, I didn't vote for Brexit. I voted to remain. But I also acknowledge that people voted and what they voted for we had to do. And also, I think you always feel as a woman, I don't live the life in Bradford or the Red Wall. I don't, I don't walk in their shoes. I live in the middle of London. So how can I say I'm right? So I'm interested in, yeah. you edited a paper at yep. the Sunday Mirror. We'll talk yep. about the Sunday Express in a minute. Supported Labour Party, and we did very strongly. But you supported the Labour Party really strongly. How hard, because from what you've said, I, I don't think you were voting Labour during that period. This would have been the period of Foot and Kinnock. Yes. So you were voting for, for the Tories. Yes. How do you, how difficult is that? Because I guess your proprietor says this is the position of the Labour Party, and then you have to um, endorse that position in your, in, on your pages. But personally, how, how, do, how do you manage it? Ask all across Fleet Street. There are right-wingers working on left-wing papers and there are left-wingers working on right-wing papers. I think that the truth is we knew we had to do a job. I don't think the gap is as vast as people make out, but of course politics likes to say we're on either side and we would never do this. It was the right thing to do to give an alternative voice and I would, I would never write something I totally thought was disgraceful. But then the Sunday Mirror has always been a, a, a very good newspaper, I think. Was it more comfortable for you when you were editing the Sunday Express, which did back the same party as, as, as you voted for? 
Yes and no, although, of course, when I went to the Sunday Express, there were people who loved John Major and people who hated John Major. On the political page, I would have um, Bruce Anderson, who loved John Major, would write a piece about John Major, and the late, great Alistair McAlpine, who hated John Major, and we would write both. And of course, I met John Major and I worked very well with him, but it's about doing what's right for your readers. Your readers become the number one thing. And... And also you want to be successful. You want your paper to reflect, A, what's going on, B, to find stories that other people haven't had, and C, to in, entertain and help, I guess. I think it's not impossible that you would consider voting for Keir Starmer at the next election. Is that fair? I think Keir Starmer has got to sort out the Labour Party. I mean, I think Keir Starmer seems to be a very decent, honourable man, although... I do remember he sat in Corbyn's cabinet. I'd love to talk to him. I'd love someone to do an interview with him about that. That would be really, really interesting. I mean, I think in a way he's in a very difficult position. He's newly elected. Then you have a pandemic. If I was to go back six months, I'd say, look, I know it's it's quite nice to score points off the government. And the government have been quite imperfect at some times, I would say that. But... I think your main job this year is to sort out the Labour Party and to sort out people who've made anti-Semitic remarks and they're still in the Labour Party and to totally convince the Equalities Commission, isn't it? The Equalities and Humanities Commission that the Labour Party is clean of all anti-Semitism because although I'm not at all religious, uh, because of my background, I feel that very strongly. And I feel that all Jews in this country feel it very strongly. And he'll have to go a long way. He's got another four years or just under four years. He would have to prove to me that A, he had the right policies. And that's the other thing. I don't know what his policies totally are yet. I don't know that anybody knows that. And he'd have to prove to me that the elements of anti-Semitism had gone and gone forever, and that the Labour Party had revamped itself, and that the Jews of Britain would trust him. You described yourself as a feminist. You have a very famous daughter, Claudia <laughs> Winkleman. I read, I don't know if this is true, but I read that when she was little, you went out of your way to stop her looking in the in the mirror and being obsessed with her with, with her appearance, not because it was Claudia, but because she was a girl and yes. you didn't want that to define her. Yes. Is that is that I true? Believe- I do. I do believe that. I mean, of course, when you're a girl, you know, you're a very beautiful woman. You know, it's quite nice to look decent. Um, But it's not everything. And I and you probably have known beautiful women who've had disastrous lives because they've relied totally on the external and not on the internal. And I think, I mean, the thing I got from my parents also, because they were other We had a really wide, diverse group of friends. My father had a Nigerian secretary in the late 50s and 60s. They felt you must not be horrible to others who are outside the normal white Anglo-Saxon, you know. And so I thought very much more important to teach her to be kind, which I think I have, much more important to teach her to be caring, much more important to teach her to read books and be well-educated. And um, it also possibly was the we ran out of money for mirrors on a three floor house. So, but I mean, I did always say, yes, of course, it's great to look nice, but there are other more important things. It's a fascinating discussion with you. Uh, Towards the at the end of the discussion, it's our job to try and categorize the person's politics who we've (laughs) spoken to. Good luck with that. Um, Now, I think you're going to disagree with me because based on the because I think you would say I'm a centrist but I think based on the conversation with you I'm definitely going to give you feminist but I think you may be a centrist but you lean you lean more right than left well I look I think that I mean I think for example the view of all of this country towards the national health has changed extraordinarily since all the pandemic broke out. I think the view for caring one another, for smiling at one another, for being kind to people has changed. I think that's one thing we've learned. I think our view on health, um, health matters very much to Jews, particularly since the Holocaust. So 
we drink. I don't do this very often because I'm not often with people who say Lachaim, but it's to life. Um, and I think we've realized nothing matters more than health, not money, not anything. Health matters most. So I think this country is going in a centrist way. You're not willing to accept my definition of you as um, on the centre, but leaning right. You're not having it. Well, a... <laughs> let me just say something else. I'd known Boris for a long time. I don't think he's a British Trump at all. He's 20 million times cleverer. And in the end, they got it right with the vaccine. I mean, you know, and I think that he, they got it wrong about Christmas, but they got it wrong for the best reason. And that won't comfort anybody whose family died over that period. And I think that he is not as right wing as people think, but we'll see. I mean, I'm open. I'm, you know, <laughs> let's see. Eve Pollard, fantastic conversation. Fantastic to get to know you a bit. Thank you for talking to our listeners. Thank you, Eve Pollard. Thank you, Gloria. 